side note, we are doing the news. If anyone watches the news, uh, PHIS webcast, we're doing it at 7 p.m. in uh, track one. There was a talk that canceled, so. It'll be more of this, but worse, but better. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not good at marketing. This will be way better. I've known Matt for a long time. We met approximately 16 hours ago, so a there's lifetime. Not, there's not anything more that you could possibly want to know about me. <laughs> I am shallow in the extreme. <laughs> I mean, you were about to supposedly publicly disclose your bank account, how to hack it. I am actually. My, my password is literally going to be on a slide. Wow. Yep. All right. So welcome. Uh, this is, let's see, what is this talk? Hacking my bank with OSINT. OSINT, I know what that means. That's really awesome. So this is Matt. How do you pronounce your last name, Matt? Tusain. Tusain. Uh, he is going to be talking about how you can hack his bank, actually. He's just going to explain it. Uh, to give him a little bit of background about Matt, he is a SANS person. He's affiliated with SANS. Also, he used to have really long hair and a long beard. And then everything changed. That's his intro. So That's my intro. good yeah. luck. Enjoy. <laughs> Here we go. Welcome, everyone. Had a good Wild West Hack Fest so far? Yes, no, maybe? Yeah. You do the Caesar thumb over here. Uh, dead. Oh, man. <laughs> Any first timers to Wild West? First timers, nice. Welcome. Wow, a lot of folks. Welcome. That is awesome. I know with uh, new cybersecurity conferences, it can always be a little daunting. You don't necessarily know people here. So if you don't know anyone, come say hi to me. I'll introduce myself to you. Watch, I think I just did that. So scratch that part. Introduce yourself to me. I'll introduce you around the table. It would be my pleasure to uh, make your Wild Bus experience just that much better. I think John and the team at Black Hills do an amazing job with this. So anything I can do to service that as well, more the merrier. In any case, Without further ado, quick PSA on this talk. I am going to be doing a number, or demonstrating anyway, a number of techniques that are almost universally illegal to do. <laughs> but I'm gonna do them to myself because I'm a masochist. From your perspective though, please don't try to use the information that you might see here directly against, uh, say look to your left, look to your right, those people, don't do that. That's called a felony. Two big benefits that we're going to get from this talk, though. The first one is it's really important for us to understand what the art of the possible is going to be for adversaries, right? For the bad folks out there. If they were perhaps a little bit better at being bad, it turns out that adversarial techniques aren't necessarily the most sophisticated, even though we call them the APT. Uh, but if they were a little bit more sophisticated, they might do things like we're going to talk about here. It's important for us to know. On the other hand, though, the techniques can be used in a professional context as well. I have done so when performing things like incident response or threat hunting. Specifically, these tend to be quite useful when doing attribution type of work. Without further ado, though, let's dive right in. So we're going to do a bank job. That's right. We're going to hack a bank. And any good bank job starts with a hustle. With that hustle, we want to pick a schmuck, exhibit A. Next, we wanna get his details, his information, and finally, we wanna take that cash because poor men do not afford Lamborghinis and I need a purple Lamborghini on the side. All right, so let's actually make ourselves a to-do list on what we need to have in order to be successful at accomplishing this gig. First off, if you log into your bank account, what information do you need to present to that system? Well, you got a username, yeah, passwords. Okay, so far, so good. You probably need to know what bank account you're using. For us, that's probably pretty self-evident because you know what you bank with, but if we're going after a schmuck, we don't necessarily have that answer. We want to find that information out too, okay? And then finally, two-factor authentication, MFA might be something that we have to deal with. If applicable, we may need to bypass that as well. Can we find the answers to all of these online? Well, let's take a look, shall we? Step one, pick that schmuck. That is me, schmuck target poser. I don't really look like that anymore, so you can call me a catfish as well. That works. It's all good in the hood. Now, when we start looking at this kind of information, we have to understand is that open source intelligence gathering reconnaissance are actually discrete services in information security. They absolutely are. That means while you might have done a little bit of reconnaissance as part of a penetration test, you're probably not thinking about this as a full stack engagement. Because most folks who've done reconnaissance work, normally it's a little module here, a little module there in support of a vulnerability assessment, a penetration test, red teaming, all that jazz. But in this discipline, there is actually methodology associated with end-to-end -end as well. And this typically begins with what we refer to in the biz 
as seed information, right? Where you're going to start from to grow your understanding of your target. Now, that might be an enterprise. In the case of enterprises, there's often a couple frameworks you may use to perform a little bit of this, things like Multigo or Spiderfoot. And the typical seed that we're using for something like that is a domain name, right? Maybe it is bhis.co. That's their website, yes. I'm absolutely here on stage talking about the people who put this thing on and evaluating their attack surface. John, please invite me back. In any case, if I look that up, bhis.co or blackhillsinfosec.com, evidently they couldn't get the bhis.com. Hmm. Unfortunate, unfortunate. If we look that up, we can take that information and we can transform it into other data. If it's a name, for instance, we could perhaps do a resolution of that name to IP address or IPv6 address, right? IPv4, or IPv6. NSLOOKUP might do that for us. So we're taking one piece of information and transforming it into another. All right, what if we have an IPv4 address? Can we transform that into more information? Absolutely. Perhaps we go to something like a regional internet registry, an RIR. Any IPv4 address or IPv6 address that is routable on the internet has to exist in one of these registries. For North America, that would be Aaron. If we go to Aaron and we look up that IPv4 address, we will then get a huge list of information about the entity that registered it. It's going to be things like their email addresses. It's going to be uh, the location where they physically reside, mailing addresses, uh, network blocks of IP addresses that are also associated with that same entity and related to the block that we have just looked up. A lot of information. We can then transform every bit and piece of that into even more. However, in our case, our target is not really an enterprise. He's a schmuck. He's me. So our seed in this case is going to be a name, just a person's name. Can we transform that into more data? Absolutely. That is the battle song of open source intelligence gathering. That is what it is all about. Now, one little thing on this one here real quick. Generally speaking, if you've got a target that you want to go after, you probably know who they are, probably know the name. But what if you don't know the name? For example, we got any gamers in the house? Yeah, let's say you're playing League of Legends, right? You're going down the lane. I'm using words that I have no idea what they mean. You're going down the lane and you're killing everyone left, right, and center. But then somebody starts just bashing you. Yep, over and over again. Kill, uh, what do you call it? Kill, uh, I don't know. Waiting for you to res and then killing you again, whatever that's called. Yes. And you're like, I'm not having a good day anymore. I want to know exactly who that 12-year-old kid is so I can send his parents some nasty emails. Can we find that out? Well, yeah, absolutely. We can put him in a timeout globally. Yes. But what's our seed information in that case? It's not their name. Hopefully, they didn't make their username their actual name. Like, oof, a little bit of OPSEC there. But it is a username, right? So it might be a UID. Can we transform a UID? Yes. We can transform IPv4 addresses. We can transform people's names. We can transform UIDs. The question simply is, what transformation are we performing? And where can we look that up? Honestly, the easiest way to do this is to start with Google. In almost all cases, yes, I know, basic, but it does work. So here you Google my name, turns out that I'm super popular. Oh yeah, you Google my name and every result that pops up right off the bat is me. Oh yeah. Make sure you misspell your kid's name on the birth certificate because then they'll SEO like I do. Yeah, my name is misspelled. My grandfather didn't know how to spell his own name. Oops, unfortunate. So means that I SEO really, really well. If you do not SEO, let's say your name is Michael Stone. Way to be basic, Michael Stone. Gosh, basic name right there. You should be cool like me, because then it's easy for the hackers to come at you. Yeah, it turns out that security by obscurity is rather successful. It's actually quite good. I know we have a big bad rap for it in the InfoSec community, because uh, it's like a matter of time until that gets overlooked or doesn't get overlooked, and suddenly you're pwned. That doesn't seem very good. That doesn't seem very safe. But it turns out that risk is likelihood times impact. And if your results don't show up until Google search result number 155, that likelihood does absolutely go down. And mathematically, that means the risk does too. It is absolutely a mathematical truth. So way to be basic. Good job. Good job. But if you are, there are, of course, ways around this, too. For example, one of the searches that we may want to do isn't just looking for professional and personal sites and information sources on our target, but what if we click on this image search thing? It turns out that people are really good at recognizing other people. Computers suck at this. They're really terrible. I mean, I know we've got all of this ML, AI-driven 
let's see if we can get some more buzzwords here, right? Big data. Uh, what's that? Blockchain. What? what? Blockchain. Block. Well, I don't know if you do blockchain in this, but yes, we need blockchain. <laughs> NFTs. It's images. NFTs. Non fungible pictures. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I'm selling all of these NFTs, by the way. If you'd like to, uh, if you'd like to purchase one, just hit me up afterwards. Uh, we'll make it happen. Uh, I, I take I accept payment in both Bitcoin and especially I'll give you a discount if it's Dogecoin. Oh yes, oh yes. But the point is, if we look up image searches, you're probably going to be able to recognize your target better than a computer can. This is particularly useful if our target doesn't SEO very well, because if we click on any one of these images, oh no, my Zoom feature broke. That's unfortunate. Oh. There it is, it was just off screen, nice. So if you click on any one of these images, yes, I know they're all terrible. You click on any one of these images, it's gonna show you where that was listed on the internet. That gives you a site where you know there's gonna be some information about your target, that's useful. But here's where it gets really interesting. Reverse image search. Save that image, Google the image itself, and you're gonna be able to find not just the page that SEOs well, but anywhere else the user reused that images. See. Pictures, selfies, are a lot like passwords. People make one and they use it everywhere. Yep, reuse, absolutely. This means that we can find the not very high in the search results pages by doing this. For example, let's say that Michael Stone, basic, happens to uh, volunteer at a youth soccer program with his daughter. That's probably not gonna SEO all that high. But if there's pictures on that website and we do reverse image search, suddenly found it. And that can be particularly useful. Let's take a look at some of this information. Oh yeah, one other thing on this. We're gonna be trying to get in my bank, right? I'm trying to get into a bank, any kind of institution. All of these things have workarounds for authentication because they need to be able to provide services regardless of what you messed up. Let's say that I have two-factor authentication and I, whoops, lost my phone. Oh, that sucks, really unfortunate. Well, can I get into my bank now? No, does my bank have a workaround for this? Absolutely, absolutely, they all do. And there are a couple of ways where they might do this, but one of the common ones that you may see is this, where they say, okay, you don't know anything about yourself, but we still need to prove that you are you. So take a picture of yourself with some kind of known identification card, like a driver's license or a passport, passport in the same picture, and we'll use that for identification verification. It's very, very common workaround in the case of two-factor authentication systems being lost. How do they know it's been lost? Because you told them. So this doesn't mean that it's a real user, an attacker can absolutely get to the step two. And guess what Photoshop is useful for? Yes, can we Photoshop all this? Absolutely. What about a driver's license? Does the information need to be real? No. If I am Bank of America, I cannot look up a driver's license in a government registry. I am not the FBI. We can fake all of that information, just like our fake IDs that we got when we were 20, right? Yeah, oh yes, just me, oh shoot. Yeah, we can fake that. This is identity, identity verification, but in this case, we are manufacturing that. So images, very, very useful to collect for our target because then we can manufacture the identity verification, presuming that we even need this. We might be able to find all the information out there and just straight log in, but sometimes we may need to bypass a defense and there's no weaker system than the human when you call them up. So. We go through that information, you'll see that uh, person, so today has been in the Air Force, you can tell by the stunner shades, excuse me, aviators and the bomber jacket, I'm really cool. Oh yeah, by the way, really cool. Then he went and worked for this little company called BHIS, I think they do InfoSec, but I don't know for sure, probably don't do a very good job of it though, huh? That's why I left, I went to SANS, uh, became his course author for SANS on the vulnerability assessment side, and then I moved over to Open Security, which is a company I founded to do all of this kind of work, pretty similar to Black Hills itself, all right. Well, then 2020 happened, and I went ahead and decided, you know, let's go ahead and funge that image search. Good luck with that one, Google. Heck, when I shaved from, oh, shoot. Uh-oh, there we go. When I shaved from this paragon of human existence to this mistake, my phone didn't recognize me. Oh, snap. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with it. Laptop seems to be working just fine. Let's try this one more time. Actually, instead, let's not use the peripheral. This is how you can tell I'm a real hacker. 
real hackers never work well with PowerPoint. Um, I don't know that that's me in this case. Yeah. One bit. Perfect, you got it. <laughs> Physical layer. All right, so I'm going to need you two to hold your breath. <laughs> okay, there we go. Zoom feature, baby. There. It follows the mouse, so. There we go. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so 2020 happened. And uh, then I had a cyber Jesus phase. Yeah, yeah, that's a real picture taken in uh, uh, BC1, yeah, BC1, yeah, real picture for sure. And uh, so dude gets around, has a lot of different sites, lots of different pictures. Okay, so far so good. We got a little bit of that. But the question that we need to ask next is how do we exploit this, right? It's fine and dandy. Uh, he's got a uh, bit of a hair problem, okay? But how can we use that against them to achieve our nefarious intent? And the answer is follow the yellow brick road. We now know some professional associations with this individual. He has Black Hills, Credos, Open Security, and Sands. These are all companies. They all likely have email systems, right? Okay. With email, there's something you can do in basically every situation that you may encounter. That is going to be here. Guess and check enumeration. Oh, no. This one I actually do need it for. Wow. Technical difficulties will not stop, will they? I'll just talk to it. So here, I'm typing in a legitimate email address. This is matt at blackhillsinfosec.com. And what happens next is Google says, okay, what password do you want to type in? That makes sense, right? Type in your email address, then you type in your password. But what happens if I type in the wrong email address? It presents us with a verbose error response, and it says, we couldn't find your Google account. Hmm. So we can tell if we got the right email address or if we don't. And there are two major email systems for both personal use as well as business use. And that is Microsoft and Google Workspace. In this case, we can tell that Black Hills uses Google Workspace. Oh shoot, am I enumerating more attack surface from Black Hills? Please invite me back, John. Yeah, okay, so this works. Can we do a little bit more with that? Absolutely. Here's MailSniper. MailSniper is a PowerShell utility written by Bo Bullock at Black Hills. Absolutely amazing tool. Amazing tool. Uh, recently, it's had a lot more development on it too, which I'm very pleased with because Bo is absolutely terrible at accepting pull requests. Yes. If the community is updating its tool forum or making adjustments or improving it, those things sit in Bo's queue for two years, three years. Just ask me. Mine sat for three years. Yes. But there's some more people involved with the project now as well who are modernizing it very heavily. It's fantastic. If you haven't seen MailSniper recently, I highly recommend you go check it out. This tool is great. How does it work though? Well, let's get those deets, shall we? This is MailSniper. In this case, I'm looking at a list of potential email addresses and I feed them into MailSniper and MailSniper automates this bit and tells me exactly which ones are real. MailSniper has support for EWS and OWA, that's Microsoft stuff, and it also has support for a G Suite for business. Ah, it's Google, Google Workspace now. All this rebranding stuff, right? So it supports both. Regardless of which one you've got, you can use MailSniper in order to get those email addresses, which is our first step. As we start to collect this information, we want to put it in our mind map, right? We want to collect the information and we want to store it and remember what we've got because this is what we're going to now transform against as well. So next step, what about the personal? This is business, I got that. We get the domain names from that Google search. We see what organizations associated with, pop in a mail sniper. What about personal accounts? We can get a lot of information from personal accounts as well. Boom. What else can we do? What else can we do here? Companies, we so far have used it to get email addresses, but what if we actually went in to that website? and saw what it said. This might be things like press releases where the individual's name tends to be, uh, be put into. It might be a blog, it might be a, uh, a biography. It might be their LinkedIn account, went back to the, uh, the socials, with all kinds of information about where they've been, what they've done, where they went to university, and so forth. We can also use database searches to enrich that information even more. 
There are a couple of these out there. One's people, that's P-I-P-L. Another one is what you see on the screen here. This is Spokio. Uh, Spokio and people, they essentially just search public databases of information. There's some more things that they do. There's some correlation on top of that. But by and large, what you want to think about with these tools is they look for publicly accessible information. That means we could OSINT all of this manually if we so choose, but a tool like this will automate that and make it happen quite a lot faster, which is very, very handy. Yeah, that's not gonna work. In this case, if you look at this, you're gonna find information about myself, my father, and my mother. Thank you, Spokio, for SEOing those perfectly. You're also gonna see addresses here, the exact addresses of where I have perhaps lived. And if you look at the top left-hand corner of the screen, you'll even see it on a map. And it seems like I may have lived in Alaska, in Texas, and perhaps in Washington state as well. This is all gonna be extremely useful information for us to transform into more data that we can use to log into the bank. So when it comes to finding personal email accounts, which is generally speaking what we need to log into the bank, though a lot of people do use their professional email as their bank login as well, they just use that one email. Uh, there are also a ton of people out there who just use an AOL account that they got back in 1999 when the world was about to end and they just didn't, <laughs> didn't do anything past that, like nothing at all. Yeah, oof. Guess what their password is? AOL, <laughs> probably, probably. I was gonna go with password, but the same idea holds true. Yes, if it's an AOL account, almost guaranteed the password is oof, unfortunate. As in, if you wanna continue with the rest of the step, do so because you choose to, not because you need to, yeah. But in this case, my name happens to be pretty, you know, unique. And so my email is just m 2 saying very easy to guess. But Michael Stone, on the other hand, might be something like mstone35. This makes it a little bit more challenging. But there are tons and tons of ways to uncover personal email accounts, particularly if the person that we are targeting happens to be in IT or a developer or in security, because we interact with a lot of information systems. And those information systems interact with other information systems. They just slap data around. For example, here's a GitHub project that I wrote once upon a time. In fact, I wrote this on Google Code. Anyone remember Google Code? Good, good. <laughs> You've done yourself a favor here. Yeah, that thing's been defunct for a decade. But it needed to move over to GitHub because GitHub back then was just coming up. And it went ahead and Google told the world what my personal email address is. Absolutely. And that's 2014. Well, I guess it's 2015. Oh no, it's 2013. Jeez, that's been a while. Yeah, so that's out there forever. Absolutely is. And this is the kind of thing that you have to understand about your personal email account. Security by obscurity is likely not going to be able to defend you or help you out there, particularly if you've used the internet a lot and to do more things than log into your AOL account, right? If you've done more than that, then there's more attack surface as well. Here's just an intriguing example but any system could do this, any system could do this. So now we've identified more information about our target. We wanna map that information as well, because we're gonna keep this mind map going and building until we are confident that we can be successful in our bank job. We've got email addresses now, but what about those passwords? Yeah, we still need those. That's where things really start to get fun, isn't it? Let's get ourselves some passwords. The first and easiest way you may go about acquiring credentials for a target is through a technique known as credential stuffing. Credential stuffing is extremely powerful and it is extremely easy to do, like extremely easy to do. These days, if I'm doing a penetration test or a red team, I am generally armed with real credentials for the real organization before I have started the test at all. Why? Credential stuffing. What credential stuffing essentially is, is breach data weaponized against your organization. You see, we create accounts on all kinds of different systems. Who here has a LinkedIn account? Oh, I'm sorry, I probably have your password. Why? Well, LinkedIn was breached. LinkedIn was breached really, really badly. And they used unsalted MD5 hashes to protect their credentials. Unfortunately, this is very, very easy to break quite easy to break. One round of unsalted MD5. There's even, even rainbow tables you could use against something like that. And as a result, something like 80 to 90% of those credentials were cracked regardless of how strong your password actually was. This means if you have a LinkedIn account, one of your passwords was probably exposed in that breach. And that's just one breach. That's just one breach. 
LinkedIn tends to be particularly interesting, specifically because LinkedIn is used for professional work often, right? That means LinkedIn is much more commonly associated with your professional email address. So something like matt at bhis.co, I might have created an account using that, which makes it even more weaponizable. For using personal email addresses for personal accounts, that's better. That is much, much, much better. It makes credential stuffing a little bit harder to perform. That said, in essence, it just means we have to do a little bit more OSINT to make the credential stuffing just as powerful. We may want to look for more than one email address in that breach data. All right, so far so good. What breach data? Well, LinkedIn, okay, it's probably a great one, but if I want to know what breach data happens to have a given email address in, I might use a site like Have I Been Pwned? And if I do this for myself, yeah, it looks like a few of those email addresses have been in breaches. What breaches? Scroll down. And it'll tell you exactly what breaches they've been in. LinkedIn times two. Thank you, LinkedIn. Absolutely. Why get breached once when you can get breached twice at twice the price? You know, why not? So yeah, here's a bundle of breaches. This is not even the whole list. Well, certainly not the whole list of breaches, but even the whole list that affected me personally. What's our next step? Follow the yellow brick road again, right? We want to get this breach data. If we look through that breach data, we may end up with credentials. In the case of breach data, there's two general styles that we will interact with in information security. The first is credential sets, and the second is raw breach data. A lot of folks don't realize this, particularly information security folks. When we're doing credential stuffing, we typically only care about email address and password because that's what we want to use to log in. Right? If we want to exploit into a user's system, maybe it is Windows Active Directory and we're using PSExec to move laterally from one host to the next host. We might want to try a password from a breach and if that password is reused by that user, now we are in. Awesome. We'll use that in pen tests all the time. However, we have to understand from an OSINT perspective is that that's only a very, very small amount of the actual breach data. These breach compilation lists that are only username and password, I've seen those go over 100 gigabytes. Now note, this is username, password, plain text, a .txt file, over 100 gigabytes of real usernames, real passwords, that's common. Now, how much data do you think it might be if we're looking at the entirety of the breach itself? That's gonna be things like your home address, maybe your social security number, basically anything you told LinkedIn or Tumblr or Patreon, I guess, I guess it's both Tumblr, Patreon, and LinkedIn, all of those things, anything you've told them about yourself whatsoever, maybe even your credit card information is going to be in that breach data. These aren't the breach data sets that we often use as pen testers, but they definitely are the breach data sets that we may want to use in open source intelligence gathering. And here we see an example of that from one of these breaches. I blurred out some of the information to make it a little bit less sensitive, but well, you know exactly how to get it. Google for the breach data, find it, and, and look through it. Now again, some of these breach data sets are so darn large that opening this file, even in a command line editor, could crash your computer. They're that big, they're that big. So you may even want to consider using tools like Rust's grep, that's rip grep, just because it's more efficient, it's faster, and it turns out when you're dealing with plain text data sets that are in the multiple terabytes large, you need that, you really, really need that uh, because of how much data is there. But essentially all we're doing is we're searching through this to look for information about our schmuck. If we didn't get the data that we want, we move on to the next breach, and the next breach, and the next breach. In incident response, I've used this technique before to, um, I wouldn't say per se get a conviction, but to discover a individual directly who had done nefarious insider threat attacks inside of their environment. This is actually a hospital. And they called us up and they said, hey, look, we think we're breached. And I said, um, what happened? The response was we had 12 appointments that were canceled and we don't know why these appointments were canceled. And my response to that is, I don't think you're breached. There's no, like, what is the threat model here that we're talking about? What adversary is gonna go in there and have a full ability to ransomware the entire organization, walk away with 2 million, and instead they just canceled 12 appointments? Like, what? No, no, I don't think you're breached. But they told me, ah, we really want you to take a look. We really want you to take a look. And so we did. And it turned out absolutely something nefarious was going on. But instead of the threat model I was thinking about, right, ransomware attackers from Russia, the threat model here was an insider. And it was actually pretty sad, in my opinion. Um, the insider was just an employee of this hospital, and she was really, really getting stressed out and overworked, and she didn't have any PTO, and she wanted to take a little more time off. And so what she did is she went into the system, 
and she canceled a bunch of appointments. So she got an extra day off. Now that's bad, right? You can get fired for that kind of thing, but it's not quite illegal yet. Here's where it got nasty. She didn't want to get caught. All right, fair enough. She didn't want to get caught. So instead of their, their appointment cancellation system would essentially SMS the, uh, the patient to let them know their appointment has been canceled and to reach out to schedule a new one. So with her insider knowledge, she knows exactly what this looks like, knows exactly how this is going to work, but she doesn't want to SMS from her phone because that's some very obvious attribution, right? So she goes off and registers a third-party SMS spamming service. Anyone ever get an SMS message that's trying to sell you something? Yeah, that's these services, right? Now, is that service a third party? Yeah. If you're sending patient healthcare data to a third party to SMS out, is that a HIPAA data breach? Oh, yes. Suddenly it's gotten real, right? Suddenly it's gotten very, very serious. It was interesting, though, because we knew what the system was where these SMSs would be sent out of, and we could tell that it had occurred there. But what happened is she was logged in with her account, and then there's a logout event. So we're looking at the event logs here in this instant response. There's a logout event, and then immediately within 10 seconds, a login event as the local administrator user. Yes, all of their users knew the local admin password to all of their systems. I don't recommend that because then these kind of things may happen. And so she logs in or somebody logs in as administrator. This could have been potentially a remote desktop login or it could have been somebody else using her PC. We don't have direct attribution of anything yet. In that login, she tries to send these emails out or these uh, SMS messages out, but she forgot her password, the SMS system. So now she logs into her email to reset the password. Oh, snap. Now we have some seed information that we can really pull apart, right? But she was pretty smart. That email address was not associated with almost anything. Google for the email address, the only thing we were able to find doing standard OSINT, not on the deep, dark places in the web, doing standard OSINT, the only thing we find was a Flickr account from like 2014. Wasn't very useful. We did this. Was it in any data breaches? Yes. Which data breaches? Oh, it was actually this one, B2B, yep. And then we looked it up, found the email address in that data breach, got her full name, got her mailing address, got her work address, got her phone number, got her backup phone number, and then found out that she's also a foreign national. So I very likely may have gotten someone deported for that. Ah, oh, yikes. InfoSec is not fun, is it? Well, for me it is bad person. This is a lot of information though, right? This is a ton, a ton of data, and it is often overlooked by us in information security, but it is absolutely out there. Now, is it easy to find? Generally speaking, no. You see, if you take a breach data set like this and you host it up on Google Drive, Google will take that down. Absolutely. Because these organizations don't want these data sets to be out there on the internet because they are dangerous. They are absolutely dangerous. But if you put something on the internet, it's kind of there forever, right? So generally speaking, if you're looking for these kinds of data sets, you might Google for them, but you're not going to find it on the first page of Google search results. You got to start digging. And once you look to your right and you see the 4chan website, you look to your left and you see, oh, I don't know here, conspiracy theory here website, right? After that is where you're going to find that breach of data. Download that, look through that, and now we are off to the races. Hmm. Oh, one of the places you can find this, uh, torrent sites. Torrent sites are very, very good for discovering this kind of information. They just sit up there forever, and it's peer-to-peer. -peer. There's not really anyone to take it down. So torrent sites, if you're looking for this data, tend to be very powerful as well. If we do that for me, that's my password. Yeah, it's in there. That came from the LinkedIn breach. Oh, oops. Well, crap. Was that my password for my bank account? Absolutely. That was my bank account password. It's relatively OK. I got some numbers, got a symbol, letters in there as well. It's 13 characters long. I'll tell you why that doesn't matter here in just a little while. Remember that, 13 characters long, remember that part. All right, well, what else can we do? Remember how I mentioned you can look at government databases and government records as well? Public record, essentially. Absolutely you can. And there are some that are just absurdly easy and almost ubiquitous. So in the United States, government records, generally speaking, the way that they do authentication is they just show you the information associated with whatever you put in. That's what they do. That's it. And so we know where I've lived now, right? Washington State, Texas, or Alaska. Which one of those do I vote out of? I don't know. We got three options. Let's try all three. <laughs> and if we do that, it's asking me three things. What is your last name? What is your first name? I think we know that by now. What is a city that you vote out of? Well, 
That's something we found as well. In the case of Alaska, it's very easy. There's only one city. <laughs> oh, oh, man. Any Alaskans in the house? No? Good. Yes, dodge that bullet. Woo! <laughs> and then you look at this, and it says, okay, Matthew Toussaint, Alaskan Republican Party. Oh, shoot, this is the wrong audience for that, isn't it? Oh, man. Don't worry, it was a long time ago. I made mistakes. I've learned. I've progressed in my life. Become a better person. Please forgive me. And then it tells you the exact addresses for both my parents' house and my own. This is a little bit of an interesting slide for you to make because I did blur out that information. But at the same time, it's like, why bother? Please don't swat my family. I'd really rather you not do that. But it is actually this easy. Does it work for celebrities? Yes, it does. Absolutely. Wow. Wow. So now we update our map. We've got location information, we've got email addresses, we've got passwords, we've got it all. Nice. There's a reason why this all matters. Yes, we're gonna use our username and password to log in. But what if that's not enough, right? What if that's not enough? What if we need to bypass two-factor authentication? Well, if we know everything about our target, we can convince any support person at AT&T, Verizon, insert bank here, insert anything here, that we are them. Absolutely, we can do this. And the most effective bypass for 2FA is to pretend like it's not there. 2FA is hard. 2FA is really hard. We'll look at a couple of bypasses here in just a second. But the easiest way to get around 2FA is to ignore it. And now we have all the information we need to do that. So step three, let's get that cash. All righty. All right, bank with USAA. Well, we need to find that out, potentially. In my case, it's extremely easy. You go to any of those uh, bio pages, you're gonna see that I graduated from the US Air Force Academy. All right, Google, what bank does the US Air Force Academy cadets use? And you'll find that there's a loan that they put out for the cadets, and uh, that means that almost everyone uses it. Another way you can do this, military. Anyone here bank with USA? Yeah, spotted the feds, got them. Got you and you and you and you. Yeah, it's like 90% of those folks, USAA. So very, very easy to do it that way as well. What if it's not? Here's a couple of things you can do. First off, there aren't a huge number of banks out there, so try them all. You can do that. Now, there's a couple caveats to this. What about credit unions? Credit unions are a dime a dozen. There are hundreds of them in any given state. But credit unions tend to be only used by people who also at some point lived very close locally. These same ideas hold true. Where did they go to university? Where did they graduate high school? Maybe Google searched that. Maybe look up credit unions in that search in that region, and you're gonna find basically all of the banking opportunities that they were presented with in their formative years. Typically people get a bank and they stick with it. Has anyone here swapped more than five banks in their life? Got two people, three people, four. Nice, you are beyond average, yes, <laughs> awesome. So it's rare, which means if we can discover it, Awesome. Even if we don't know for sure, we can create a short list and now we don't have to look up every bank. We only have to look up the few that are on that short, that short list. Uh, now, next thing about USAA. Remember I mentioned something about this whole 13 character password business? Yeah, uh, oops. So it turns out that USAA truncates your password. So if you type in a 13 character password, it will take it, but it only checks the first 12. <laughs> Nice. Wow, banking, isn't that wonderful? Woo. Turns out, uh, unlike this individual, I actually know the folks who do security, some of the folks who do security at USA. So I reached out to them, I'm like, hey, bro, what gives, man? Like, what is this? What are you talking, what? And he said this, this is a true story. He said, oh yeah, I hear that all the time. Um, here's the thing. We used to get a lot of phone calls, a lot of phone calls from people who'd forgotten their password and needed a password reset, especially in January, right after the new year. A little bit of drinking too much right there. Yeah, a lot of phone calls and it took all of our HR time and it was costing us money, right? IT time, sorry. So we decided to truncate at 12 and it turns out that most people will forget their password after the 12th character. Yep, you normally remember your first, I don't know if it's first 12 particularly, but for them, when they truncated at 12, most of the password resets were for people who tried to make a password that was longer than they had the ability to remember, and therefore they became problem children. This fixed that problem. 
And uh, I don't really like that fix, but uh, okay, here we go. Did that work? Oh, it did work. All righty. Now, of course, we have two factor authentication here, right? So now we've got a username, we've got a password, we try them, and it works, but it wants us to verify. Now, if I'm on a trusted computer, it might not do this step. But of course, we're attacking the schmuck. We don't have access to the computer, at least not yet. So we have this step that comes up. Little interesting fact here. It's showing us the last four digits of the phone number here, the phone numbers that are associated with the account. Those are the only truly entropy related digits in a phone number. For example, we know that I've lived in at least Texas and Alaska and Air Force Academy, so that must be Colorado as well. That's three area codes. And it's three area codes uh, 907, 210, and 719. So that means for these first three digit sets, there are three options. Your entropy is literally three. That's not very good. So now the only thing that matters is these middle three digits. That's it. So what's the math on that? Well, it is character set raised to the power of the length. That'll be zero through nine, so 10, raised to the power of three. And then we have three options for the first three, so times three. So it is 10 raised to the third power times three. It's technically less than that though, because that assumes that you could have one character or two characters, whereas you actually need to have three characters for this middle set every time. So it's technically a little bit less than uh, uh, 10 raised to the third power times three, but that's about your entry pool for the phone numbers. That's it. Now we don't necessarily need that in order to go after the bank, but I do find it a little interesting that they're exposing some of my information that I'd rather they not do. Right. Now, it also gives us another option. I need help logging on. And this option is what we call gold. Yep, that is gold. It is amazing. I need help logging on, help me get in, please. Please, you caller here, help me hack the thing that I couldn't hack myself. Yes, let's go. And so we do that, we've got a couple numbers here to call. And I'm gonna say, I was at the beach in Dubai. And as a result, my phone has no network connectivity because I'm not in the region that I'm normally at. And so I can't log in. I can't get the SMS key in order to log in. I need help accomplishing that. Now in banking, the most common questions that they're going to ask you are things like your security questions and your social security number. We've just seen how to get all of that information, right? Breach compilation data, very heavily fraught with social security numbers. Uh, former military, so OPM breach and more military breaches. Oh, gosh. My social security number is in at least a dozen of these breach data lists. And yours probably is too. Well, maybe not a dozen. I'm a high performer, okay? High performer. But it'll be there. It'll absolutely be there, which means I have the answer to this. I have the answer to this. A lot of these systems also support um, allowing your spouse access to these systems, in which case it's expected that they may or may not know the social security number for the other person. So if this is an account with more than one people, one, one, one people, one, one person, and you see this one likely is because there's two separate phone numbers, yeah? You can sometimes get them to not even ask for the social security number, but do alternative verification as well. What about those, uh, what about those questions about your family and those kind of things, right? Your security questions. People forget their security questions all the time. The reason why it always has you give multiple security questions and answers is because they know that people are going to forget certain security questions and they need to be able to ask you other ones. So if it turns out that despite getting all of this information about me and potentially even my family, you can't answer a certain security question, all you do is give a fake answer and act confused about why it's not the real answer. It's like, I swear I put that in there. It must be. My mom was definitely born in Colorado Springs. Definitely. Hmm. Do we have another security question? And they'll move on. They will absolutely move on. They are there to help you get in. That's what they're there for. And they will. Uh, now, there's another way we can bypass 2FA in this case. It turns out that if you use, anyone here use Mac? Yeah, guess what? You can't hack Macs. <laughs> oh, except um, if we were to fish this user, knowing everything we know about him, like this is a spear fish of the century at this point, right? We have multiple email addresses to use. We know everything about them. Easiest spear fish of my life. And he's using Mac, guess what? iMessage integrates to OSX, and it is very, very common for people to have set that up. This means if I fish your computer, suddenly I have everything I needed from your phone anyways. Why well, pass for 2FA? Now, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this talk. We're not going to actually do phishing, but we have everything we need to do the phishing 
And if we did that one click and boom, we have access to iMessage. No need for approval escalation because we're in the context of that user. And so is this application. So is this application. Very, very easy. What about more advanced two-factor authentication bypass? We can do that. Uh, when we were doing the research for Mail Sniper for the G Suite for Business stuff uh, or Google Workspace, we were actually evaluating how Google does the actual authentication. And it turns out that in Google, it will respond with different ALR codes depending on uh, the information that was input and the result that it's going to go to next. For example, if you're trying to use this to identify if the email is valid or not, like we saw with Mail Sniper, what Mail Sniper is essentially doing is it's determining if it gets an ALR code of seven. If it does, it knows it's not a real email. If it gets a different ALR code, it knows it's a real email, but we can do more. And in doing this research and building, in fact, this PowerShell component of uh, Mail Sniper, I was also doing a test at the time for a Fortune 50 company. And so perfect opportunity to test it out. But it was really confusing the results we got back because I kept getting one ALR codes for direct login. This company was using Duo as its identity provider for two-factor authentication. So what's supposed to happen is you type in your username, your email address, and then it gives you an ALR code of 13 here for a login redirect. To redirect you to the Duo portal, you type in your 2FA, it goes back to Google, you type in your password, and you're in. That's how it's supposed to work. But we found hundreds of users that were responding with an ALR code of one. What does that mean? No 2FA. The most common issue that we see in enterprise 2FA today isn't that it is by it's bypassable, it's that users haven't been opted into it. The organization thinks that they are, they even click the button that says globally enable this, and it just didn't work. And in fact, in Microsoft, that is an intended feature. Why? Because there is something else you can buy. Oh yeah, pay for the better model, absolutely, that will enable that feature to be truly global. In default uh, Outlook Exchange, the way that it works is that it works on a user-by-user -user basis at the user agent level, which means if you're logging in with your browser versus your phone, one gets 2FA, the other does not. If I'm an attacker, that's easy to bypass, right? It's very, very easy to bypass. If you haven't tested your 2FA system inside of your organization, you need to do this. You absolutely need to do this because most organizations who use some form of 2FA think they have it. And it turns out 20% of the users actually have it. The other 80%, there's workarounds. I absolutely are. Pen testing, great way to find that. Absolutely. And then finally, we're now in, and it is time to walk away with that cash. I guarantee there's tons and tons of money behind this Glossian blur, for sure. I'm definitely not broke. Don't call me on that. <laughs> All right, that brings us to the end of our time. We have four minutes left, so I think I have time for a couple questions. Any questions? Just a comment. Your point is, at some point, some encounter or whatever said, hey, this is going to cost us more money to support people who don't know how to log in than it's going to be to lose money. Yep. So. Yeah, so the point was, uh, I'm, re I'm repeating this for the uh, virtual uh, attendees. So the point was that uh, uh, businesses are making decisions on our behalf where they're making a trade-off decision, right? We say, our money versus the security that we provide our clients and which one do they go for? It depends a little bit on the organization if that organization really wants to get in new clientele because they're saying, hey, we're the most secure versus if they already have a lot of clientele and that's not necessarily their market strategy, they may prioritize being less secure in order to make more bank. And in the case of banks, that tends to be the one that is. <laughs> in case of most banks, not just USA. Uh, I think there's a question in the back. Sorry? I'm married. I don't have kids. Uh, I think the kids are the one that helped with that. But the comment is, if you're married, you don't got lots of cash. I am dual income, no kids, baby. Woo! <laughs> yes. They switched over from a free model to a business model a couple years ago, and stop regular people from using their kids to verify your business. Yep. So the question is, how do you use people, uh, PIPL, if you're not a business? Uh, it used to be that you didn't have to be a business in order to do that. Same with Spokio. Spokio, you still, I believe, don't have to be a business. The way you do this is you go to your state and you register an LLC for 500 bucks, and then you're done. Yep. Yeah. What's your take on like voice recognition? Because like, so many banks are enabling systems now are based on 
That's a really, really interesting question. So, go, uh, so this question is about voice recognition. This is taking us back to what, 1984 with sneakers? My voice is my password, authenticate me? Yes, woo! What is my take on it though? I find that to be very, very interesting. Anyone here have an Alexa? I know for everyone who's virtually attending, I just triggered their Alexa. Hey, Alexa. <laughs> uh, so have you ever experienced an Alexa where you maybe have multiple people in your family in the family group, and it can tell who is asking for a playlist of music based off of the voice, and they'll actually pick the playlist for that person? Very, very kind of creepy, but also interesting at the same time. So based on ML and AI and neural networks and more buzzwords, this is starting to grow very heavily. But what is the potential for uh, false positives specifically is a really, really big question. For example, whenever a new biometric authentication, voice, for example, is a biometric authentication mechanism. Uh, that's what you are as opposed to what you have or what you know. So whenever a new biometric authentication mechanism comes out, people always want to test it. Ever, anyone's ever seen the twin test? That works very, very well for face ID. Yeah, we got two twins, they do this, works like a champ. Same with thumbprints for them. Uh, sometimes you can also get around it by simulating things. I think specifically to voice, it is unlikely that it's ever going to be secure because you can also use the same exact technology to create somebody else's voice, right? But I, it's a great question. Yeah. So we use Metal Sniper a lot. And occasionally someone sees a G Suite. And this is no offense to you, but it's a nightmare. Any, any recommendations for how to like when we have those types of clients? It's like we're we're almost like password tricks. Um, I don't know. I've actually had rather decent luck with password spraying against G Suite. Um, with mail sniper modules. modules. Now, the mail sniper modules are really funky for G Suite. That's my fault. I wrote those. My bad. Um, so uh, let me jump back to the slide with mail sniper. It's actually showing the G Suite here. Uh, Google does something really, really, uh, I guess it's not cool, but it is powerful when you try to log in. And so, and this is part of the reason why we did the ALR research. Wow, too many slides. There we go. And so if you notice here, the string is actually really long. So it's going through, but it also is using proxy hosts. So it's rotating through a bunch of different hosts. The reason it does that is because if you try a bad username on Google more than three times in a row, sometimes five, it depends a little bit, uh, but more than three to five times in a row, it gives you a captcha. And now Mail Sniper is like, oh, what do I do with this? But the thing is Google does those captchas based off of source IP address, which means if you rotate it through a bunch of proxy hosts that you can spin up in AWS, it will work like a champ. Uh, I imagine that's probably your, uh, your difficulty, right? Yeah, Google password sprays are actually really fast because their site is efficient. Isn't that funky? It's like the site is so efficient, it's easier to hack because we can guess passwords even faster. Uh, but you do have to, with Google, either use something like these proxy hosts or you can actually just funnel it straight through a tool called Proxy Cannon. I highly recommend taking a look at that one. That one's super useful. Um, I use that for Mail Sniper even when I'm going after OWA, actually. It's a couple of questions from Discord. Uh, someone said, or Sergeant Dean said, how do you have any defenses for this kind of stuff? How would you reduce your attack surface? Okay, great question. First defense, make sure your kids' names are basic. <laughs> <laughs> right, so defenses against this. Uh, this won't quite work against me because I've checked all of this against myself, right? So is my password still the one that's on the screen? No. No, because I, I've looked regularly. So if you do these techniques against yourself, 100% legal to do that, right? 100%. And if, you, if you're concerned about this and you do this to yourself, you will know exactly what the art of the possible is for the attacker, and then you can adjust against that. Now, again, with this, the most difficult hurdle to overcome was MFA. Absolutely was. So the number one defense beyond that, multi-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication, let me say it a dozen times, MFA. Unfortunately, in the banking sector specifically, in fact, I was at a fintech conference last week. Oh my gosh, these guys are literally just going 20 years back in the past, re rediscovering all of the issues that we've been trying to patch. And so that whole support chain to get around, it works exceedingly well. Also works pretty well in the hospitality industry. And unfortunately, as a result, it makes your banks much easier to hack than your Facebook account. Isn't that crazy? Your bank's easier to hack than your Facebook account. All right. Well, I think we're out of time, but thanks everyone. Thanks, Matt. Awesome. It was great having you all.